Lists and or lists are very interesting. They're, they're unique to QBFC. A list is multiple aggregates or elements of the same type. So for example, in a customer query, I can provide a list of list IDs that I want back or a list of full names that I want to query for in a single customer query request. So that's represented by a list ID list or a full name list within QBFC. Then there's the OR list, and this is a unique beast. It contains multiple aggregates or elements of different types where it has to be unique. It, it's mutually exclusive. And you see that in, for example, an invoice that can have either an item line that you get added or an item group line. We'll see that in a few minutes. Finally, there are the methods for each of those lists. Uh, lists. There's add or append, count, and get at. So, for an example, there's the list ID, transaction ID, and full name filters that I talked about a moment ago, or expense lines or invoice lines. Uh, or sorry, expense lines specifically are list items. In an OR list, you have, for example, the invoice line list that I talked about, where you can have an item or an item group line. So each item within that list is either an item or an item group line. And there are some query responses. If you are doing a high-level query, such as an entity query that could return customers, employees, vendors, or other names, then you're going to get back an OR list within that entity query, with each element of that OR list being either a customer ret, a vendor ret, an employee ret, and so forth. So here's a simple, straightforward use of the OR list object in an invoice line add. So we create that invoice line add object. And we tell, it, we tell the invoice add request that we want to look at that invoice line add list, and we want to append an invoice line add. And then we can use just that invoice line add to set the item ref and the quantity. If instead we wanted an invoice group line, we would declare our invoice group line add as an in I invoice group line add, and so forth. So how do you handle a response in QBFC? First, you get a count of the responses, and you step through those responses, getting the status from each. Then within a given response, you may have a list. So you'll step through that list, as we did with the access demo, where we stepped through a customer list. You'll check for object's existence, and you'll grab the data that's relevant to your application. So to get that response information, you create that iResponse object, take it out of the response list, and move forward with it. To get to the attributes of a specific response, you just hit this, the dot, and you see the attributes available to you. In this case, the status code, making sure that it's not zero. And then I can look at the status message, status severity, and so forth to build a message box to indicate that an error happened. To get the details of a response, when there's an actual customer response and so forth, I check that the detail isn't null. So if there was an error, then I might get nothing in the detail. So I check that the de detail isn't nothing. Then I walk through, make sure that the type is what I expect it to be. In this case, I'm expecting an invoice add, so I verify that it's an invoice add response and I get the individual response within that is the invoice ret object. And that's the response detail. And again, that is an upcast. Once I have the response itself, I'm ready to get elements from it. If I need the transaction ID from an invoice add request, then I grab the transaction ID element and get its value. If, the ref, if I want the ref number, I need to make sure that it's not nothing, because there doesn't have to be a ref number in an invoice. And I get that invoice number from uh, the invoice. Very straightforward. To walk through an OR list is a little bit more interesting. First, I make sure that the OR list isn't nothing. And then I walk through that list, and for each item in the list, 
I need to check its type and handle that type for my application. So here I check whether the type is an invoice line ret and if it is then I know I've got an invoice line and I need to handle it. Otherwise it's an invoice group line and I need to handle it. If I'm just using a list, not an OR list, then I don't need to do this type checking because I'm guaranteed that every item in that list is of the type for that list. But an OR list can have multiple types within it. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the most common problems in QBFC. This is probably the most frequent support request around QBFC. And that is the use, or misuse in this case, of the append function. Here we see invoice add to and append an invoice line add, immediately setting the item ref to installation, and then we do it again, append, immediately sending the quantity to three. This looks pretty straightforward, pretty simple code, and when it's buried in a in a large program, it's easy to miss this. But the append function, this is the important thing to remember. The append function in QBFC, no matter where it appears, always creates a new object. So the code above is really creating two invoice lines. The first one has an item but no quantity, and the second has a quantity but no item. And you'll be confused as soon as you get a response from QuickBooks telling you that there was no quantity and there was no item ref. And you look at the code and you say, but I did. I su supplied the item ref and the quantity. When, when you use the 2xml string function, it will be immediately obvious to you, as where you expected to see only one invoice line, there will be two, one with a quantity and one with an item. So the proper use of append is to call it once and store the result from it, and then set all of the values within that aggregate that you appended. So in this case, I'm going to store the invoice line that I added, and then using it, I'll get its item ref and its quantity and set their values. So that's it for the gory details of QBXML and QBFC. We've scratched the surface, and you should have enough information to move forward and create your first conversation with QuickBooks. So now what I'd like to do is look at some of the things that we haven't had time to cover, just so that you know what you don't know, as Donald Rumsfeld would say. There are several developer tools available, different approaches for different environments. There's traditional programming environment support that give you a much higher level object view. We talked about the fact that there are customer ret, customer add, customer mod objects, and so forth in QBFC. If you want an even higher level, if you want to deal with a customer object that has add functions and so forth, there are several options out there such as ActSync or core objects. For specific application environments, there are a number of libraries out there, some that let you program visually and so forth. And for ODBC environments, there's QODBC, which provides an ODBC view to the QuickBooks data. What's important when you look at any of these higher level tools is that you still need to have that base level of understanding of the QuickBooks SDK to make sure that you don't do something that from the API's perspective seems perfectly reasonable but could cause QuickBooks to generate extremely large responses and so forth. Again, there's a URL in the slides there that will give you the complete list of developer tools as we know it. So, so far, everything we've talked about has been about accessing QuickBooks data. And that request response model that we've talked about has been great. But sometimes, to make the application flow ideal for the user, it's helpful to know that the user has done something in QuickBooks and respond to it. For example, I might need to keep track of additional customer data. I want, might want to keep a picture of every customer so that uh, when I see them come in or when they call me, I can remember who it was that I was talking to. Or maybe for an employee, I want to keep track of their fingerprints so that I can use a fingerprint-based time tracking tool. Those are 
cases where it's helpful to know that a new customer or an employee has been added to QuickBooks and pop up a dialog asking for additional data that's relevant to your application. Or maybe you want to send estimates to people in the field as one of the applications in our marketplace does. It would be helpful to know that that estimate has been created in QuickBooks so that you can pop up the dialog that says, do you want to send this now? So QuickBooks 2004 introduces events that enables you to work, create a workflow that's effective for your users. So there are data events that notify you when, at, when data is added, modified, merged, or deleted as, it's, as your application may want to know about or not. There are UI events that tell you when a company has been opened or closed. And there are UI extension events that allow you to add menu items to QuickBooks and you'll be notified when that menu item has been selected in QuickBooks. The event model is very straightforward. Your app subscribes to events it, it wants. And not surprisingly, it is again XML based. You build a subscription message set. You provide your application name, your uh, prog ID, or your class ID that, we that you want the notification sent to. And there's a simple notify function that we'll be looking for in that, uh, in that object. Then you send that subscription request to QuickBooks. You don't need a session because you don't need an open company file at that point. You just need that connection. That means that you can subscribe as part of your installer. The first time QuickBooks starts up after you've sent that, message, uh, that subscription request, the admin will need to approve the subscription and therefore also approve your application's ability to communicate with QuickBooks. And when the event occurs that you've subscribed to, QuickBooks will send event XML to you via a COM callback. It will have just enough information in it that you can query for whatever additional information you might need. And then there are some other SDK features that we really haven't had time to cover today. Error recovery, I've mentioned only briefly, and there's a wealth of detail there. I encourage you to read the concepts manual for detail on all of these uh, aspects of the SDK that we haven't covered. There are macros that help you to reduce your parsing effort. So if you need to, for example, add a bill, add a bill and immediately add a check to pay that bill, then you don't need to parse the bill add in order to get the transaction ID to reference in your bill um, payment check. There are data extensions that allow you to ask QuickBooks to store data on behalf of your application, as well as the QuickBooks custom fields and how the, the SDK interacts with them. There are reports to get the data or tell QuickBooks to display the data if you're talking to QuickBooks 2004. QuickBooks 2003 lets you get the data from reports but not display it. There are tools such as the subscription viewer that lets you look at how your subscription requests have been processed. And there are out-of-process COM wrappers to help you support uh, web-based applications. We haven't talked at all about remote data sharing, which allows your application to quit access QuickBooks over a local network. And we haven't talked about the aspects of QuickBooks Online Edition. Pretty much all of the concepts we've talked about apply to QuickBooks Online Edition. The difference is in how you communicate. You post XML to QuickBooks Online Edition and get back the response as the response in that post. And we haven't talked about the troubleshooting tips. Again, all of these features are covered in the concepts manual, so I encourage you to take a look at it. Finally, I wanted to talk about a couple of frequently asked questions and look at some additional resources as you study the SDK further. One of the most frequently asked questions from new developers is, why not just support IIF, which is the Intuit interchange format? Well, IIF bypasses the QuickBooks business logic. And this can lead to company files getting corrupted. Accountants call it corrupted when there's incorrect or invalid accounting data. And this, is, this can occur frequently using IIF. But you can also corrupt a file by breaking the referential integrity of the database because you're bypassing all of that business logic. And we've found that this really drives call volume at Intuit Technical Support. So if your application uses IIF, you will be solely responsible for supporting the user. If the user calls us, we'll have to tell them, 
you need to call your third-party application vendor when we find out they've been using IIF. We also find that a very significant percentage of QuickBooks customers are very uncomfortable with navigating the Windows file system. They can't remember where they stored the export file from one application in order to find it to import it into QuickBooks. Or vice versa, they tell QuickBooks to export the file and don't remember where it got stored. And we find that double imports are especially troublesome. If you import a customer list twice, you can corrupt the company file. So that's why the SDK is there, to provide robust, real-time, two-way communication with QuickBooks that does follow all of the QuickBooks business logic. So looking at how we go further, we have the roadmap to complete understanding of the SDK. You'll see this as, show me how to get started with the QuickBooks SDK after you install the SDK. And each of these elements is link, directly linked to the document in question. What we've covered today is pretty much the technical overview. And we've touched on some of the concepts in the concepts manual. But here's the recommended roadmap. There's the technical overview followed by the concepts manual. Then, depending on how you want to communicate with QuickBooks, you choose one of the developer's guides. The on-screen reference is there to give you the specific details of each individual request and so forth. There are sample files to support you. And then, of course, there are the various resources on the web from IDN. There's a frequently asked questions list and a knowledge base. There's the developer forums where you can interact with the entire IDN community and ask questions. And there are many experts there that can help you to answer your question and I troll there frequently at myself. Finally, there's developer support itself. You can, as a pro or premier member, you can submit a support incident and we'll get back to you very quickly. Finally, there are the various web resources. Our main website is, of course, developer.intuit.com. And if you're watching this on the web, you know about us at developer.intuit.com. But you may not know about the developer forums that I mentioned a moment ago at idnforums.intuit.com. There's our developer support email address. And there are the third-party tools URL that I mentioned earlier. And if you're interested in seeing what other developers have done, there's the Solutions Marketplace at marketplace.intuit.com or marketplace.intuit.com slash accountant that give a complete and comprehensive list of the applications that are Premier members have built. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to go over the QuickBooks SDK essentials with me today. I hope that this has been useful to you and that you will be able to begin making your first conversation with QuickBooks in the very near future. If you have any questions, remember that IDN Developer Support is there to help you.